very delighted to have this sacred time and place with you. We are going to just open in prayer, kind of stage set for tonight's theme very quickly, and then introduce Father Nathan Cromley. So let's begin in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Dear Lord Jesus, this coming Sunday, in the midst of great struggle and turmoil and clouds and confusion, you lead three of your beloved disciples up the mountain, and you make yourself manifest, Lord God. Right now, Lord, we gather desiring all the more that you be manifest, that the sacramental grace of our baptism, of all the sacraments we receive, particularly from our holy marriage, that we'd uh, be in their light, we'd experience that holy mountain in our souls and as a married couple. That we'd be anchored there, Lord, that we'd see the surpassing majesty and glory of your lordship, that it would uh, dispense, dispel every shadow and every darkness. Lord, we unite as couples in this very night, and we ask, Lord God, for your uh, kingdom to be manifest personally, marriage, family, and the world. In this hour, Lord, we do pray the situation in Ukraine and Russia and throughout the world that is truly a manifestation of, of rejecting you, that we would in this moment recognize the unsurpassed power of taking this time to choose you. We do choose you again, Lord God, in this moment, that this is the place you want us to be. This is at the burning bush. This is at the I am moment where your light is manifest to us. We open our hearts and minds to be attuned to you, chiseling us the character, discipleship character, to live according to our identity, as an image of you, that we'd image you, Lord God, to the world. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So blessed to see that Welcome. our speaker is here. Father, we showed your amazing video, and we're going to cue you in just a moment, but so delighted to have you. Um, so, folks, we are entering more deeply into the Trinity. Genesis 1.27, the world is pining to see God. And in his image, he made us male and female. Our primary identity from which flows our mission is to make God who is love known. So the T last week from the pinch hitter was to recognize that truth is the fabric of it all, to know the truth. And in this culture, we see truth under attack. I'm not going to repeat everything we had last week. We do have that program. For those of you who are new, we welcome you and mm -hmm. see our good friends here. But the idea that truth is not some something we can create, but someone in whom we are created. Truth is not something that we can create, but someone in whom we are created, and that is Jesus. And from that truth, which is the path paving eternal life, we have the occasion to live in the abundant life, not without suffering or struggle or difficulty, but Christ alive in us. If we follow the path he's given us, particularly the gift as Catholics. So the R, once we know the truth, is to respond is to respond, to pray for the grace, the sacramental grace, to respond to what God reveals to us. So with no further ado, um, we're going to, as, as with last week, the same format, 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll break up into small groups, and I'll guide you along the way. But uh, we are very, very blessed to have our beloved friend, a native of this area, Father Nathan Cromley. So you can clap if you want, but once you warmly welcome <coughs> Father Nathan Cromley. Listen, we we are here at the beginning of this Lent and fired up as we go into the Trinity here. This, and I love the the idea that I get to talk about response because that's what I do. That's what my ministry is all about. It's about the response that we make. Uh, be, and, and let me just be honest. I think that a lot of our Catholic world is missing the boat. I get to travel around the country in my my ministry. Um, and as I go, I'm amazed at how many dejected, anxious, frightful, fearful, sad Catholics I run into. Uh, Christians, you know, if there's any non-Catholics here, you know, you're welcome. Glad that you're here. You know, I use the word Catholic because I'm kind of on the team, you know, so, you know, I represent my brand. But, you know, you can apply this to any denomination that you want to. But the, the fact is, I'm amazed that we seem to think that we've been defeated. And it's because someone's got it into our head to say that we're defeated. And the easiest way to become defeated is to believe that you already are. Uh, defeat is a mental game. It's not, I mean, you have, you have so many things going against us, the rise, the metaverse, 
which is it's just going to arrive. If you don't know what it is, you need to look it up on YouTube because it's coming your way. Uh, Facebook just pledged one hundred and eighty billion dollars, one hundred eighty billion dollars to have this thing built in the next 10 years. Uh, we Microsoft just built bought Fortnite for sixty eight billion dollars. Uh, so that it could have all the technology necessary. When you got that kind of numbers being thrown around, you realize, oh my goodness, we don't have any control over our lives, right? You don't have any control over World War III starting and having to hear about it in every single story that you have. You don't have any control over whether you want to wear a mask or not, whether you want to be vaccinated or not. Control is just something people don't have. And that makes you feel like you are spinning out of it. And when we think that we could have a Super Bowl halftime show that features two of the most prominent anti-women people we've our cultures ever you know, spawned as the, the, the entertainment at the halftime. I mean, like, am I the only one outraged by this? I feel like I am. Uh, I, but like, I, why is that the case that I'm the only one outraged by this? I'll tell you what, every halftime show from here on in, I'm doing my own and I'm going to start to advertise it. I want to get a hundred thousand people watching my halftime show because I'm ticked off about this. If you had Pope Francis get up there to speak at the halftime show of the Super Bowl, people would be protesting that he's anti woman, but when Eminem and Snoop Dogg, don't even read their lyrics. They're the most horrific things you could find. Choose to grace our stage. It's not even a grace. They disgrace our stage. We all sit there and say, oh, we'll pass the Fritos. I guess it's time to be entertained by Snoop Dogg. You know, I'm not going to be entertained by Snoop Dogg because I'm responding. You see, the whole thing is, what's your response going to be? And of course, you have three different kinds of responses. You have, I can respond to to truth by implementing it and building, which is, of course, the right response. I can respond to truth by staying in the status quo and just saying I'm a nice person and not doing anything, which is actually to therefore not respond. But and then or I could actually fight against the truth. And today you've got the three choices. Choice A is the only one that's authentically Catholic. Because in choice A, where I build with it, I end up meeting the power of Jesus Christ and I find the, the pathways of the resurrection in my world. I mean, and my friends, to, to, to build with as a response to the truth is what faith in the resurrection means. And so when I say build, I mean really building. The number one spot where I build is I accept in my heart of hearts that I'm going to be alone. And this is, I think, as I look at the spiritual landscape of what's happening in the country, this is the, 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 the spot. There was a time where we could live in a kind of Catholic womb. That's what I like to think of it as. It was warm. It was life-giving. It was soft and gentle. Our Holy Father is absolutely amazing. And, 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 and he's showing us how to be, be not afraid. And we're there in 26 years of this wonderful womb of a saint. And look at him now, just one victory after the next. And Veritati's splendor comes out and he cracks the whip on women's ordination. And he says, no, the discussion is closed. And you're just like, this guy is absolutely amazing. And yet he's open to World Youth Day. And you've got millions. The largest gathering in human history is under his pontificate. And, and we're just like rooting away. Then in comes Pope Benedict, the, uh, the elegant statesman, the diplomat, and we're staying in the womb. And he starts doing the Latin mass and getting Latin going again. And all of us are just feeling like we understand what it means to be Catholic. All right. Well, you know, times have changed a little bit. And I used examples of the Pope, not just to speak about, you know, what some people are struggling with sometimes in their faith life with respect to church leadership. Uh, because it's not just, you know, in the presence of the Holy Father with some people can have troubles with, but then some people can have troubles with the bishop and the bishop was this or the bishop is that or our priest or this or priest or that. We've gone through scandal after scandal after scandal. 2002, try being a priest. If you think you got it tough, just try being one of us. Walk around every time we turn around, we're getting told that another one of us did something terrible. A friend that you knew, actually, you didn't know, you know, and it's just like. And you look around for what's normal. What's normal? I mean, to have our priests close our churches down 
and be as a priest, I got to salute you or salute these priests at the same time. I know you guys are mad at them. We took a vow of obedience. We took a vow of obedience. And so like, you know, oh, you should resist. <laughs> okay. Okay. You know, you, you know, it's fine. But then again, like when you made a vow of obedience and you get a clear order from the person you made a vow of obedience to, it's also can come from a good heart that they close the churches. We can get mad about it if you want. I just want to also defend them a little bit because not all of them were happy with it. And a lot of priests were just were caught in the middle. What do you do? And in all of that, what's happened is that we look around and then I look at your families. You're now being, you know, we don't know the gender of our child. If we're allowed to do a gender reveal, if what pink means, what blue means, no one knows. And yet we can't even say this or that. And we have to relinquish our rights as parents to a school system that's going to tell us a different history of our country than what we thought and claim that we are racist, even though we're not racist. But actually, I am racist because I didn't even know. I. <laughs> and, and then what does that term mean? And you're just spinning your heads and you're like, we thought the world was stable and that right meant right and wrong meant wrong, but we don't even know. And in all of that, you know, situation, the temptation for you guys is going to be to despair, to be stunned, to turn around and say, there's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can do, honey. What? And so we we'll either just going to go along with it. I mean, we don't want to be mean. We, we know we want to be nice. We want to, you know. Or, or, you know, maybe the whole church thing is wrong anyway. You know, this Bible kind of thing. You know, we actually had one Jesuit priest named Father James Martin, you know, and he's walking around. He actually tweeted an amazing tweet. He said, it's absolutely without a doubt that the Bible condemns homosexual activity. The only question I have is, is the Bible always right? <laughs> Father James Martin, Jesuit. like, And you're like, whoa, he took the tweet down, but I saw the pictures of it that was up there. Now, what do you do with that? When you, I mean, like, do you believe the Bible? I mean, well, I don't know if I believe the Bible. After all, I mean, nah, nah, everything in the Bible, you know, I'm like, yeah, everything in the Bible. I mean, I, I just started turning to preaching the Bible. I carried over my heart. I got it right here. I carry it over my heart right there. I got my Bible. I carry it with me. I love it. I kiss it. I read it. I preach it because this is the pillar of truth right here. This is where the, the sword of the Holy Spirit, it's moved there, and it's my rock. And I tell you what, if we lose that rock of truth as the Bible, what do we have that's left? Where am I going with this? I'm going to tell you that you've got to accept that the womb is gone and that that's actually a good thing. When Moses takes the Israelites into the desert, they got nothing except dependency on God. They have no houses to protect them. They have no jobs to protect them. They don't have any relationships to protect them. They don't have their relationship with the local grocer to protect them. They got nothing. They're out exposed. And God does this on purpose. And he takes our Lord and the Spirit drives him into the desert. I've been to that desert where our Lord was. It's the worst place I've ever been on earth. I've been to a lot of places, okay? I've been to 29 countries. And that desert, I mean, I'm a backpacker. I go to the desert. The American Southwest is the Hotel Hilton compared to that place. There is nothing. I don't even, I was looking, going, where, where would he have stayed? And I was, I was looking. I was thinking, how would you, where would you stay? I have no idea where he stayed. The only type of relief in the landscape is the ditch where the flood water would go through the wadis. So he would have like, I don't know, dug a hole in the side of a wadi that I don't even know. There's like, there's nothing. There's not even a rock to hide behind. It's horrible. And that's where our Lord was alone. Alone. What do you do when your priest lets you down? What do you do when your world lets you down? What do you do when the president lets you down? What do you do? You know, most people that I'm finding today sit and complain about it. I'm telling you, I don't have time for it anymore. And you shouldn't have time for it anymore either because it's a waste of time. And if you're really that scared and you're really that fired up about what's going on, you don't have time to waste. <laughs> it's really kind of a simple option here, guys. I just was on US 24 going from Defiance into Toledo yesterday. And there's a big billboard that said, keep America great, Trump 2020. A billboard is out of the road. <laughs> I'm like, it's 2022, bro. You know, like I get it. You know, you love the guy, but like, seriously, I'm like, how long are you going to, are you going to keep complaining? You know? And it's like me, you know, I get like due respect to everybody. 
I'm just saying it's a symptom. I keep seeing people thinking that if we were in 1952, we'd be fine. Let me tell you, in 1952, they were thinking they'd be back in 1930. And as everyone wishes that they were all 50 years before they were born. The saints rise to meet the challenge. You have a mission to fulfill called your family. That is your mission ground. I don't want to actually say, I think we're suffering from a huge bout of spiritual pride because all the, the news fills you as if you should be knowing and rooting for whatever president of whatever country is doing against the Russian military. You're not a president of a country. There's one thing to want to know what's going on. Okay, you can know what's going on. But when you start taking it personal and you start rooting and spending your energy thinking about geopolitics, guys, uh, you're wasting your time. It's a huge distraction and it can end up becoming from pride. It's like folks that want to tell the Pope how to be Pope. You might have a difficult time. You might have reasons for being upset about things. Fine, but get over them quickly because no one is going to ask you. <laughs> Sometimes people ask me, Father, what do you think about the church doing this or that? I say, well, the moment the Pope asks me, I'm going to tell him you waiting for him to call. He'll call any minute. I'm just sure. He's never going to call. You, you don't get access. And yet we're thinking in our brains that we got to save the church by getting all involved in this or that. Or we got to save the church by, by or we got to save this. Or we got we to get in father, tell father what he should be doing and what he shouldn't be doing. To a degree, yeah, fine, you know, but to a degree. I'll tell you what God's expecting of you. He wants your spouse in heaven. And he wants your kids to be strong in hope. Are you giving hope to your kids? Or are you giving them just a dose of fear about what's coming on? I was like, there was another guy who pulled the alarm. He was the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church in 1814. Uh, you know what he did? When Napoleon inv invaded Russia, this guy made a public pronouncement that Napoleon Bonaparte was the Antichrist of the Book of Revelation. He pulled the alarm bells, 1814. He was wrong, okay? You don't have right to pull the alarm bells. I don't care how, who you think you are. You're not God. The, the, the alarm bell that needs to be pulled is, it does my wife know that she is loved by me more than anyone else in the world right now? Does she know that? Is my husband confident that I have his back and I am never calling him into question or call, thinking, to, thinking to myself that I'm going to disrespect him. Does my husband feel disrespected by me? That's your mission. Well, yet you guys aren't even investing in your family. Your kids are on their stupid phones playing games while you're talking about the vaccine. You know, I tell you, put the phone down or put the vaccine down, dad, and sit out there and start playing baseball with the kids. I mean, you'd be doing so much more for this world if your kids knew how awesome a dad was who wasn't afraid of the Russian invasion. <laughs> I tell you, am I the only one? People are like, it's got to be World War III. I'm like, I'm not afraid. Bring it. I mean, I don't want it, but like, whatever. I'm a saint of God. I believe in the resurrection. What does that mean? That means, yeah, bad times are going to come. Bad times will come. Bad times will go. I was given this time to give to God. My response to truth is to build with it. And so how do we do that? Number one, in my heart, I accept I'm going to be alone. I just accept to stop waiting for a hero to replace you. Okay? And we did that. We're like, oh, Father Nathan, he'll replace me. He'll... What is he saying these days? You know, well, you just heard me. I said, just like, stop watching me and start talking to your kids. Okay. That's what the deal is. Oh, no, Father Karapi, he'll replace us. No, no, no. Where's Mother Teresa? Mother Teresa, you know, after Mother Teresa died, you had people criticizing Mother Teresa because for this reason or that reason. Pope Benedict, the man is a saint. I mean, like, if Pope Benedict's not a saint, like, we're all in trouble. Let me just say that. I mean, the guy's, like, walking around the Blessed Mother praying his rosary, you know? And yet we're going to be like, no, that man is just worthy and be despicable. And I'm like, who the heck are you, pal? What have you done for God? 
I tell you what that guy's done for God. I couldn't even begin. You know how many books he's written for God? How many hours he sat there studying for God? He didn't go to the amusement park. He didn't go to the baseball game. He sat at his desk and learned Latin and Greek and Hebrew to read the Bible. So did he make mistakes? Maybe. Do you know who else makes mistakes? Everyone. A saint isn't someone who didn't make mistakes. A saint is someone who stands alone in front of God and, and gives his love back to him. And so, like, I think, in other words, we got to first of all just accept it. Heroes, the, the epic of heroes is over, unless it's Eminem. Then you can give all the adulation, I guess, you feel like you want. Like, give me a break. So, Age of Heroes is over. What, what, what do we replace it with, right? What do we do next? I'm the hero. So, I'm the hero. I am the wife of this husband, and I'm the mother of this household. Okay. I totally need you, Jesus. I'm going to hide in your mercy, not so that I don't have action, but so that I do. If I really trust in your mercy, Jesus, then I'm going to smile in the face of all this crud thrown my way and all this fear about this vaccine, the shedding. Oh, my gosh. I mean, you know, all this stuff. Do your homework. You know, I did my homework. Let me just throw it away now. okay? because like I got to live, you know. Can we not have a birthday party? Can we not play baseball? Can we not laugh? Turn off the news, you guys, and start making it instead. And I'm not just making that up. This news is a toxin, and it's getting us all so focused on everything we shouldn't be focused on. Uh, Meanwhile, we don't do family meals because our kids are going crazy. We don't have a vacation every year. We don't learn the violin. We don't have a conversation. I'll give you a cool challenge if you want to do something neat. It was a guy from Texas gave me this. He said, I started, I think it was eight years ago, to book 30 minutes with one of my children every week. One-on-one, I made an appointment with them because he's kind of a nerdy business guy. (laughs) So he's like, I have it on my calendar. I I do an Outlook thing. There it is, 4.30 to 5 on Sundays every Sunday, one of his kids. And he sat there and we started to tear up because his eldest daughter was going to college. And he said, Father, do you have any idea that I've spent, and I forget the number, 72 hours in one-on-one conversation with her? She knows me. I know her. We're friends. Uh, you want a challenge? I want you to do that. Dads, don't let another, another week go by without a one-on-one with your six-year-old, just you, every week. You imagine how special it's going to make them feel? It's going to make them feel like awesome. And that's what we need to do. So listen, the, the Lord is with you, right? When, when Moses told the Lord he was afraid, and he had more problems than we do, I just want to point this out. <laughs> the Egyptian army was about to massacre his entire people. Hello, go back, Exodus 15, you know. Every time he cried out to the Lord and was like, I got nothing, God, God gave him the same answer, and it drives me crazy. It's the best answer ever, but it drives me crazy. He just said, I will be with you. <gasps> Now, now, I thought about that and thought about that. And as I read about it, I look, go back Exodus 3, go back when they're about to stone him, and go back when he quits, Moses quits. I'm in. It's like, it's like all you moms who've had quitting moments, take solace. It's right in the Bible. <laughs> Moses did it too. He's just like, I can't handle it anymore. These kids are. And I'm done. He's like, and he said, he actually tells God, I wish I would die. I wish I would die. Like, wow, wow. You know, you're like, I've been there, bro. We're all like fist bumping Moses. You know, he's on the ground. He's like, yeah, what's up, bro? Like, you know, he knows it. And so what, what does God say to him each time? I will be with you. That's it. Now, the reason this is so powerful to me is that I started thinking about it. And I started going through the other stories in the Bible about David, about Joshua. And then I started going on further. And I realized that the theme of the Psalms The Lord's love is steadfast forever. And then, of course, you know, the mountains falling and all of that. And then you go to to Isaiah and you start listening to the prophets and they're always like, Israel, the Lord is yours. The Lord is with you. And then I come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And what does he tell us in Matthew 26 when he goes up to heaven? He says his great commission, go ye to the ends of the earth, for behold, I am with you always. 
And it blew me away because I finally, I only learned this a year ago as a Catholic priest, understood why we say that at Mass. The most powerful thing I could say to you as a Christian is the Lord be with you. I can't give you an answer. I can't tell you what, to, you know, what China is going to do to Taiwan. Like, give me a break. Like, I, when they call me, I'll tell them to not go to Taiwan. In the meantime, I got to talk to you, you know. And, but like, I'll tell you what, the Lord be with you. And your response is so powerful and with your spirit. Wouldn't that be neat for you to turn to your spouse tonight and look at her in the eye and say, the Lord be with you. And she's like, I got to do all these things. And I'm so far behind. I'm so worried. I'm so scared. And I got an anxiety. Aunt Betty's dying. Aunt Loretta's dying. Everybody's dying. Ah, you know, and you look her in the eyes and say, the Lord be with you. And if she were to look at you and say, and with your spirit, I mean, like just the power of that phrase is so powerful. I want to finish with wishing you all that because as we go forward, option three and option two are not an option. I am not denying the truth. And I'm certainly not going to sit there afraid. I tell you what I'm going to do instead. I'm going to respond. I'm going to respond with the Lord because he's with me. Father Nathan, standing ovation, very deeply blessed, very, very deeply blessed by you and your words and uh, that we receive it. If we could receive your blessing then. Dominus vobiscum. Et cum spiritu tuo. Et benedictio Dei omnipotentis, patris et filii, et spiritu sancti descendat super vos, et maniat semper. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So be assured of all of our prayers. And for everybody, I'm saying this for Father, I will send you information on how you can not only pray for them, but financially become a partner with the phenomenal work that he's doing. And I will connect with all of you about that. God bless you, Father. Thank We're very you, grateful Father. for you. We love you. Thank you so much. You. Three questions. Question one is, everybody share, take 90 seconds in your group to share a moving moment where you encountered Christ in your life. And I know you can say when I'm at mass, that's for all of us, hopefully. All the sacraments, those are easy answers. We know they're true. Share a meaningful experiential moment of an encounter with Jesus Christ and the difference that it made. And then the second standard question is simply based upon what Father Nathan said, what struck you, challenged you, inspired you, what questions did it raise? If you're so inclined and you have space or time, feel free to bring up the uh, this coming Sunday's gospel on the transfiguration. And you can ask the same question. What struck you, challenged you, inspired you? What questions did it raise? So just a quick commercial. Um, this is a prayer that I had begun posting on Mondays through my Facebook page, just the regular text. And I encourage people to list their children, grandchildren, and godchildren along with it. And it's amazing really how it proliferated. People look forward to this every Monday when I post it. And a number of them said they printed it out black and white, put it on their refrigerator. And uh, some priest friends of mine and others said, you really need to turn this into a prayer card. So we did that. We designed it literally this past week. And I'm going to encourage you, if you are so interested in joining me in a minor partnership, um, for $15, is goes would go directly toward giving you a hundred cards and mailing them to you to put in your church. And if you don't have $15, that's fine too. I want to I want to send them your way anyways, just to unite parents in praying. So we're going to do a double prayer. I'm going to put Andrew and Brittany on, uh, on the spot in a second to lead us in the couple prayer. But for this prayer, I'll lead this one in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, let your holy anointing be upon each of our children, grandchildren, and godchildren this day. In your sacred name, we claim them for you. We renounce all whispers, lies, and influences of the enemy. We pray right now that each know your loving presence, be forged in virtue, and be flooded with an abundance of your Holy Spirit to live fully their identity and mission in you now and through all eternity. Amen. Thank you so much, though, I want to say for being with us this second stop of a seven stop journey and um, be assured of our, you know, contact us anytime, email, text or whatever. We, we are so united in praying for you intentionally in your families and blessed to be on this journey with you. In the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Lord Jesus Christ, together we proclaim that you are love itself. We acknowledge that your love holds us in existence. We proclaim that our marital relationship is the very fabric 
of your love. Today, again, we receive the powerful grace flowing from our sacramental marriage, flowing from your very heart while you were dying on the cross. Lord Jesus Christ, together with confidence, we bring to you every struggle, difficulty, and challenge. We recognize in these your hand molding us for sainthood, the opportunities to sacrificially pour ourselves out for the good of one another, always, without counting the cost, without reservation, that we might become like you. Lord Jesus Christ, together we recognize that our marriage and family is the primary target of Satan, adversary. In your name, we renounce all his lies and whispers that in any way has held or holds us captive, that in any way has influence. Right now, in your holy name, the name of Jesus, through the powerful intercession of our blessed mother Mary, who crushes his head, we break his chains definitively, completely. Lord Jesus Christ, together in this very moment, we humbly avail our souls anew to you. In this very moment, we pray that you flood us with an abundance of your holy presence, that the authenticity of our faith will constantly shine through, ready forgiveness, apology, and pursuit of your magnanimous love. Lord Jesus Christ, together we thank you for the amazing gift you give us in one another, in every way, the opportunity to attain holiness, to become what we are in you, to become saints. Today again, we reclaim and declare our marital identity and mission to make you who are love known. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Son, Holy Spirit, amen. amen. You are free. There is no rudeness associated with just cutting out. Steph and I, as always, will stick around if anybody has any questions or wants to interact or anything you want to share. But uh, God's abundant blessings and peace be upon you all.